All right. Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful Saturday. It's kind of chilly um, here. Uh, and we are going to get started on finishing this freestyle fly that we started last week. Oh, man. Um, so if you remember last week, uh, the reason why we're tying this fly is because I wanted to show, you know, what you could do with uh, materials that are readily available or cheap. Um, you know, feathers that you can pick up at a, a front, you know, from a friend who's a hunter or, um, you know, your local pet store when they sweep up whatever's left, you know, whatever feathers the, uh, the parrots and parakeets um, shed. Uh, and so, yeah, we are in the middle of this. And um, today we're going to do the wing and finish out the fly. Um, I don't have a very solid plan. I've got uh, feathers picked out for the wings, but other than that, um, we're just going to be uh, seeing what comes along. Uh, now, <clears throat> the um, the feathers I've picked out for the wings are these uh, very nice uh, macaw uh, coverts. Um, they're not perfectly matched in terms of color, but uh, they are matched uh, in terms of their curvature and size, so they'll do. Um, now, one thing that I did want to, you know, just talk about briefly is how to how to match your feathers, and um, you want your feathers to be matched uh, in curvature, so you know how much they they uh, um, you know curve. And you want a right and a left. Uh, one way to know whether your feathers are well matched um, is to put them back to back, and then to see how straight they are when they're against each other. So you can see these are pretty well matched because the this um, the feathers back to back. Uh, are and what's happening is the right and the left are curving towards each other and so when you put them together they're balancing each other out perfectly um and that's that's a good pair uh now again because i got these out of a bag of pet store feathers they may not even come from the same bird but because they're the same size the same curvature and of equal force in their you know or equal resistance in their stems uh, they make a good pair. Um, and again, like I said, these aren't perfectly matched for color, but, you know, that's fine. Um, you're only ever going to see one side of the fly at a time anyway. Um, so, yeah, uh, this is a very nice pair. Um, other beyond that, uh, I know I'm going to do, you know, some green macaw uh, strips, uh, some maybe some blue macaw horns. Um, again, feathers that you can get from a pet store, uh, not just the specialty shops. Although I will say for some of the larger tail sections, uh, pet, sh pet shops or like eBay shops, um, you'll probably pay a little bit more for them, uh, if they make you pay. Uh, but again, if you have a friend, easy. Um, what else? Uh, there's going to be a, a a curl head probably. Um, but beyond that, uh, I, I think I'm just playing around a little bit. Um, well, I also pulled out, so, um, you know, one of the things about getting bags of um, pet store feathers is that uh, it, they take a little bit of patience. So, uh, and by that, I mean, you should, you'll have to dig through quite a few feathers to find, you know, feathers that will match up, pair up like this. Um, I think I, last week I showed, I don't know, four or five bags worth of feathers from, from pet stores and, and friends with parrots. And really I only came out with probably six or seven well-matched pairs. Um, and then <clears throat> what I do, um, it, depending on the size of the pair, uh, I will either tape it to a card like this, um, or 
I will put them in baggies together. So here's a couple of other pairs that I have. And that way I just keep the pair together. I know which feathers go with which. Um, and, and stay organized that way. But again, out of those five or six bags, I probably found one good pair per bag. So yeah, you can tie these flies on a budget using uh, pet shop feathers. You'll just have to be a little patient. Um, there's nothing nothing you can do about that because uh, you know not every feather is going to have a matching pair, and not every uh, not every feather is going to be usable. Um, but you know <laughs> these birds produce so many feathers. There's bound to be something. Uh, eventually. All right. So, um, enough talking. Uh, I've got <laughs> enough talking about that. Um, we get to some tying here. Uh, I've got as normal, I switched my thread color from white to black. Um, because, uh, that way again, uh, it just kind of, um, hides the, Tension's a little high on my bob, bob in there. Um, it just hides the the white, and you know it helps blend things in once I start putting on head cement. Um, right. Uh, so the way I prepare my feathers for full feather wings, um, and I will say, full feather wings are probably the easiest to do on a budget um and the reason for that is getting materials that are of sufficient quality to marry together easily um can be difficult uh on a budget you know uh, a good a good turkey turkey dyed white turkey might be 12 to 15 dollars per pair um if you're paying, if you're trying to use, uh, you know, like dyed floric and mustard, um, that's probably comparable. Um, it's fairly difficult to get into dot, uh, married wings. Um, oops. If you're uh, trying to tie, you know, large salmon flies, you know, four aught, five aught. If you're using goose. Uh, just because goose one doesn't tie very long and two um, it's also a very soft fiber. So when you're trying to tie, you know, a wing that is 24 fibers thick um, goose can be a little bit difficult to tie in properly. Um, so full feather wings uh, are a good place to start um, and you can do it fairly cheaply again if you if you use the the friend or pet, pet store method um, if you're tying smaller sizes uh you know one aught or you know size one one aught uh, it is definitely easier to find uh, uh, materials to make married wings All right, so <clears throat> to prep these feathers, um, I'm just gonna choose the size, uh, how, how, how big I want this wing. Make sure my tips are lined up. And I want, I want the wing to extend slightly past the bend of the hook, uh, just to balance that. And then I'm gonna find, from my perspective, what I think a good tie-in point is, and I'm just gonna mark it with a fingernail. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna strip away all the excess fluff um, at the base of the feather to the tie-in point. Uh, and I am going to begin by stripping away the excess fluff equally on both sides. And then I'm gonna check it again. Um, okay, a little bit more.
All right. So it'll it'll look a little bit like this once it's tied in from your perspective. Uh, and that's that's pretty uh, pretty attractive, I'd say. Um, now there are a couple of ways to deal with the fact that in order to tie this on, you're going to have to set this on top of the hook, and there's all this extra excess material underneath here. Um, my preferred method is to not trim it. So I know in some 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 tires will take the scissors and will just trim the bottom so that it's flat uh, and parallel with the, the top of the body. Um, my preference is not to do that. You can also use, you know, you can tie it in and then you can use a, a bodkin to gently fold fold it until uh, it, it settles. And that's my preferred method. Um, I don't... <clears throat> Um, and the reason why I don't like trimming the bottom um, is just because if those if um, if you're not using a side or if you're if your uh, cheeks and side you can see that cut that line of cut fibers and um, I don't I just don't think that uh, looks uh, very nice um, it's a little bit abrupt to me uh, in terms of the flow of the fly um, so I definitely prefer to, you know, try and gently fold those excess fibers <clears throat> or the extra excess length of fibers, uh, along the top of the body. Okay. So let's tie this in. Um, and we'll tie this in, we'll tie it in, take it off, tie it in, take it off a few times, just because one, we want to know, we want to figure out whether we got, have the length right. And two, we want to make sure that as we tie it in, um, it goes on straight and even. Now what I'm doing here is I'm just taking that right at the tying point that I've determined and I'm just gonna flatten the, the, the stems, the rachises, and I'm gonna trim the ends as well um, just because the ends get really thick and they can get in the way. So um, <clears throat> that's all trimmed out. Uh, now I'm just going to lay the wing on top and I'm going to take one, I'm going to, I'm going to tie it in the first time and then check, uh, I'm going to flatten this a little bit more. And you want this to tie in right at the top of the shank. Um, there's no... Okay. Um, so one, using, using that tie-in point, this is a little bit large. The wing is a little bit large, even for this hook. Uh, so I think I'm going to move the time point. Uh, hang on, this, this hook keeps shifting in place. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to shorten the wing, probably by another eight, like eighth of an inch. Um, and two, what you can't see, what I might be able to show here, is that you can see the wing is opening up like this. Um, and the reason for that is, I flatten the rachises uh, perpendicular to, so if this is the, the fibers of the, the feather, I flatten the rachis like this. The problem is, is I'm tying it onto a round shank, a round hook shank, and so the rachis is actually being tied in like this. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, when I next flatten the, the when I go back and take the wing off and flatten the rachis again, I'm actually going to, give it a little bit of a twist like this so that when I tie it onto the hook, then the two, the two feathers will be, um, uh, will meet up again, uh, instead of folding out like that. So, <clears throat> but otherwise, uh, yeah. Um, I like the way that looks. 
Uh, color wise, uh, from a composition standpoint, I just need to shorten the wing uh, a little bit, and then I need to um, give the raguses a little bit of a twist just so they go on a little bit uh, straighter. So take it off. Uh, so it's a little bit less. Maybe even a little bit more. Um, actually, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tie it in here, and then I'll see how it looks. Uh, it's always, you can always take more length off a wing. You can never put it back on. Well, I mean, you can, but not without using a multitude of sides and cheeks <clears throat> and uh all right so again um initially when i flatten the rachis i'm flattening the rachis perpendicular to the direction of the fibers and i'm going to give it a little bit of a twist so this is the right hand wing or the far wing so i'm just going to give it a little bit of a twist as i flatten it uh, so that's not quite perpendicular, and that'll help compensate for the the roundness of the shank uh, that it's being tied to. Um, and I'm going to repeat the same process on the f uh, on the near wing or the wing closest to me, but I'm going to just do the opposite direction. Um, and it's it's pretty subtle um, of a of a change. Uh, there are a couple of other tricks that you could use um, to get the wings to uh, stay flat against each other. Uh, but this is this is my favorite. Um, we can talk about some of the other tricks um, that you can use, uh, but uh, this one works pretty well. Um, the other thing that you'll have to, that um, there's a little bit of an inevitable gap because the, 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 the stems themselves have a little bit of thickness. So there, there's inevitably a little bit of a gap, but uh, overall, that is not half bad. Yeah, and uh, I've reduced that gap. So if you can look now down the wing, I've reduced that gap by probably two thirds. It's not quite on straight, but yeah. So I've reduced that gap by by two thirds or or more. Uh, so that's that's about as good as it gets without you know doing some more radical things. Um, and I'm not a, such a huge fan of of kind of those more radical things. Um, one trick that I have learned for things with round round stems. So the stems on a, on a, um, like a macaw body feather or a parrot body feather are actually kind of rectangular in cross section. So uh, it makes them easy to flatten, but they tend not to stick or back up to each other very well. Um, one trick that I've learned for things like uh, golden pheasant crests where uh, the stems are round, you can actually take a piece of thread and you can tie them together right at the base and they'll, it'll draw the stems close enough together that the, the tippets will basically flatten out against each other perfectly. Uh, and I, I do that sometimes with my underwings, but for the most part, um, you don't have to. Uh, just a little bit of extra twist in the stem before you turn it, try, um, uh, tie it on, uh, works well. <clears throat> All right, cool. Um, I like that. I like the way it looks. Um, I'm actually going to back the thread out a little bit. 
Um, now, uh, just because of the angle of the, the wing, I actually tied it in in the front and I'm tying the thread back as I tie it on. And that helps bring the wing down towards the body. Uh, you really can only do that with full feather wings uh, simply because of the way that they're tied on. Um, it's pretty difficult to do that with uh, most other kinds of wings. Um, so let's see, where was that? Oh yeah, I'm going to wax, <laughs> wax my thread and bind down the wing uh, and that'll help make it not move. Now, if you do need to shift the wing on the body before you wax it in, uh, you can take the, the the tips of the feathers, whoops, and you can use them like a like a steering tiller or like a, a an extra just like handle, and you can shift the wings like this. So, of course, you don't want to shift them too much, otherwise, you do that. Should probably just tie this on. Playing around with it too much. Okay, taking my wax. Man, I don't know what's up. Can't get this secure as I would like. Uh, and I might have just shifted my wing around a little too much. There. Yeah. Okay. Don't like that. Now, another way to ensure that your wings sit as close to the body as possible is if you tie them on, you know, close. Um, if you tie them on a little bit long, and then you can pull on these tag ends, and that'll draw the, the, the extra... Um, Okay, sorry, I should say that again. That was not well put. Um, you can tie on the wings a little bit long and then you can pull on the extra tail end of the, the, the stems and that'll draw the feather under the thread wraps and that'll help push it down too. Um, but because these stems on these macaw body feathers are so thick, um, that doesn't always work so well. Yeah, okay, I like that. Oh man, I am having trouble with my vice today. Hey, if you want if you want to contribute to the uh, Brad Needs a New Vice uh, fund, check out my Etsy shop, Studio1213 on Etsy. Um, okay, so I that the the length of the wing looks great. The 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 set of the wing looks great. Um, cool. Let's uh, and that wing is about as straight as it's gonna get today, or ever. All right, so we're gonna trim up the fronts. We're gonna trim these long. So. Um, we're going to trim these long and we're going to trim these at an angle. So, uh, you know, the, the, the trick to getting a smooth head is that the first thing's on at the head 
go on a little bit long and then everything gets progressively shorter as you trim or in other words you trim everything at an angle that goes on top um, and that helps uh, smooth out the head um, so next uh, what's next um, one thing I did want to add to this and I'm kind of not sure the what order I want these materials to go on. But I think um, because I have green macaw in the tail, I want to do a green macaw over top. Um, but I also want to do... Hmm. What would look good? Um, I do want to do... Uh, some, gosh, would that look good? <clears throat> hmm. So what I think I'm going to do, uh, is I'm going to do some teal sides, uh, some teal, uh, kingfisher, and then, um, some, uh, some green macaw over top uh, and that'll be the wing um, teal again because we put the teal in the tail uh, and um, <clears throat> to do that uh, let me pull out my teal like I said if you have a friend who is a hunter, uh, things like teal will be fairly common. Oh, uh, teal and mallard. Um, a word about kingfisher, um, and I'm going to use uh, Eurasian kingfisher. I haven't checked the prices recently, but I think kingfisher is one of the more reasonably available uh, you know, sides and cheek materials out there. Um, I think uh, I got these skins uh, for, I think, like $15 a piece, and I bought, like, four of them. Um, so I'm pretty set. Uh, but I think uh, this is Eurasian Kingfisher. Uh, do not, <laughs> repeat, do not use North American Kingfisher. I believe those are protected species. But the Eurasian the Eurasian jay and the Eurasian kingfisher are generally considered pests over there, um, at least every time I talk to somebody from Europe. Um, and so these skins are readily available uh, in a way that North American jay and North American kingfishers aren't. Uh, so just be careful. Make sure it's a Eurasian species that it's okay to uh, own and import. Um because not all kingfisher and not all jay species are okay to have. Uh, but this stuff, the Eurasian kingfisher, is the most commonly used substitute for chatterer. Um, it does not have the same properties as chatterer. So uh, I've never done this myself, but I've heard that if you get kingfisher wet versus chatterer, um, there's a difference. Uh, Kingfisher, I believe, goes gray in color, whereas Chatter remains blue. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind if you're if you want to buy real Chatterer, Chatterer. Um, but Kingfisher is a perfectly good substitute. Um, it's relatively inexpensive, and the only thing about the availability of Kingfisher is that it may not be available through your typical fly tying shop. Uh, I know I haven't seen this in Orvis's, so I used to shop at Orvis a lot. Uh, and I know in kind of recent years, so within like the last five or 10 years, they've taken out a lot of their more specialized materials. Uh, so I think 
your only option for Kingfisher these days is through one of the specialty shops. But again, it's one of the more readily available and inexpensive things. And if you're going to be tying a lot of classic flies, so we're talking like, um, uh, like Jock Scott's, um, some of the doctor, doctor series, I believe, uh, has it, um, or some of the variations in the doctor series. Maybe not. Anyway, um, this stuff is useful uh, to have on hand. All right. So order of operations here. We're going to go teal, uh, strips of teal, um, chatterer, or sorry, kingfisher. Um, let's see. Ah. Feathers everywhere. All right, somewhere in that mess are relatively matching feathers. Hey, look at that. <clears throat> And uh, because I'm only using one species of duck for this side, I am going to use a fairly hefty chunk. Uh, maybe an eighth of an inch. All right. So, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty good chunk. Um, and I'm going to tie it as long as I can. Uh, again, because it's the only chunk of duck that I'm using. I love teal because it's barring is so striking. All right. So yeah, that looks that looks great. Um, yeah, the 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 barring on teal is really quite um, distinct and uh, very has a lot of clarity compared to you know um, mallard or wood duck. Uh, so I'm going to tie on a kingfisher feather as well and then um i'm going to reverse my thread as as usual uh it's a little bit more difficult to do uh without you know on an eyed hook than a blind eye hook um now there is a uh so i'm, I'm looking at the the back feathers here on the kingfisher skin and there's a slight color gradation and i'm going to try and pick something that is going to match the color or come very close to the color in the the body um, but it also has to be a slightly larger feather, so I might be a little bit out of luck in terms of color matching. Hmm. Mm. Now there's an interesting thought. Uh, so the the best color match that I think I have is with the with the um, the feathers here from the shoulders uh, rather than the back. Uh, so I think I might use some of the smaller shoulder feathers uh, as my sides uh, instead of the back feathers. The back feathers are the ones that we usually use as, as chatter or substitutes because they're kind of the right color, the right brightness of blue. Uh, but the shoulder feathers uh, seem to match the actual color of the king kingfisher um, dubbing rather well. All right, so I'm going to pull off. So in order to tie this in, oop, I got two feathers here. I think I just want one. 
All right, so I'm going to pull off the excess fluff like normal, but I'm going to tie it in using just that very base of the um, of what's left, essentially, in terms of the fluff. And that just, again, helps to keep the feather from rotating as I'm tying it in so that it helps it lay flat against the, the side. Um, okay, so that looks great. I'm going to tie it and tie in. Um, the other side, I'm going to reverse my thread, tie in the other side uh, so that you guys can see how that looks. Uh, let's see. My th I have let's see. I seem to have misplaced. So I'm going to wax my thread, bind down the extra fluffy bits from the end. Uh, one of the nice things about using a whole feather wing is that a whole feather, tying in a whole feather is a little less of a bulky proposition than get an extra chunk of wax here. Um, is a little bit less of a bulky proposition than tying in uh, a, a married wing. So in order to reverse my thread on an eyed hook, a couple of options. Um, I find that half hitching doesn't work terribly well, and that's just because half, hitch, half hitches don't have enough resistance. They're not enough of a knot to um, stop you know, the reverse, uh, un the unthreading of what you've tied in already. Uh, so... I, the option are either to whip finish or um, if you've left the ends of your wing feathers long enough, you can use that almost like the blind eye and slide your thread underneath. I did not do that. Um, thought about it, but I, I didn't uh, end it up. So I'm going to whip, whip this. Um, and the whip finish is is enough of a knot. And I'm going to reverse my thread, bring it to the tie-in point. I'm going to tie in. Tie in that same kind of extra big chunk of teal. This feather's not quite as... soft and as malleable as the other side. Okay, there we go. It's approximately the same length, I believe. Yeah, okay. Uh, and if you want to know if you've actually, so, you know, you can measure two pieces and then tie them in. But if you want to actually know whether you tied something in on the same length, can look down from the top and that'll and that's that's an easier way to tell uh then i'll tie in while my thread is reversed i'll tie in the kingfisher shoulder feather uh, from the corresponding side and again uh, i'm just going to strip off the extra fluff and then 
tie it in just at the base of the remaining fluff. There we go. Uh, so there we go. And again, I'm going to wax my thread. Get a stray. Got a whole bunch of stray fibers here. Okay. Uh, great. Now I'm going to whip finish. In the reverse direction, which is a little bit of a mind bend for for me. And I'm going to reverse my thread again, but in the direction that is natural for me. Cool. Um, and now uh, I just I'm going to add some green macaw on top, uh, hurl head, and call it a day. Um, this, looks, this fly is looking very, very colorful, very festive. I'm liking it. Uh, just want to clean up just a little bit so I don't have feathers everywhere. Although I have feathers everywhere anyway, but. All right, so green macaw, some very nice green macaw tail. Um, we're going to tie it in just a pair. So instead of a single fiber for a horn, we're actually going to tie in a double horn because why not? Uh, a very small part of me wonders if I ought to put like a mallard roof on it. This is something. Hmm. Okay. All right. I'm liking that. Green, green, blue, uh, sorry, blue and yellow macaw and green macaw are just some of the most striking materials um, that we use on salmon flies. Uh, just looks so good. Oop. What 
wondering if I'm going to have to reverse my thread for this macaw horn. Macaw is one of those fibers that is, you know, because it's such a thick fiber, uh, it tends to want to twist really easily when you're tying it in. Like the way this went in, you might have to do either bigger chunks or right. it's becoming a little bit of an experiment. I do apologize. Man, I like the way the bigger chunk tied in. Actually, no, I don't. I wonder if this actually needs to be tied in like a wing. All right, you know what? And individual green macaw horns, but okay. We're going to do double horns. And really by tying them in separately, so two sets of double horns, uh, by tying them in individually, we're just offering a little bit of separation between the horns and to ensure that they remain separated. And again, because this is a full feather wing and the the, the tie-in point isn't quite as bulky, uh, we don't quite have to worry so much or, or be so paranoid about thread control. So we can take the extra the thread wraps between horns. But I think that's both interesting and cool. Okay, so I'm going to wax my thread. I'm going to tie everything down. Um, all right, and then we're going to do a hurl head. Because this is a freestyle fly, and I like curl heads. And because it's a freestyle fly, get to do whatever I want. Um, I like curl heads for a number of reasons. 
Uh, I think, uh, especially if it has a hurl butt, um, having a hurl head just kind of nicely bookends the fly. And, uh, you know, it just adds a little, it emphasizes the head uh, of the fly. And I know um, it has been in the past fashionable to have as small of a head on a fly as possible. But in reality, uh, you know, a lot of the recipes for the older flies uh, specify the color of the head or the, the make of the head. Um, and that's because the head was considered kind of a, an integral, it was part of the fly. It wasn't something that you wanted to de-emphasize or make smaller. Uh, so I like to have a good visible head on my fly. Again, um, I'm not folding the hurl here. I'm just making sure that uh, none of the fibers are going to be caught going forward, that they're all going to be swept to the back. Um, uh, the other thing a hurl head does from a technical standpoint is if you've left your head a little bit long, you know, there's too much space at the front of the hook, well, you can cover that space in a hurl head and just say you did it on purpose. Um, and also it does, uh, from a visual standpoint, um, help clean up any transitions between the wing and the throat that might be a little bit, you know, not perfect. Um, but in this case, again, uh, I do it because I like good hurl head. And this hurl is not, the head's a little bit too tapered and I'm not quite getting the hurl slipping just a little bit. So uh, and I'm using a, one of the articulated uh, hackle pliers. Um, Okay, so I think what it is, is this, the head's just not quite smooth enough and I'm catching on something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unwind the hurl. I'm going to wax my thread. I'm just going to build it up just a little bit more. Yeah, I think, yeah, you can see it. I got just a little bit of a step in the head and the, the hurl's falling down that step. So... Wax my thread. I'm going to get rid of that step, smooth it out just a little bit. Okay. Wax a little bit. More more of my thread because I'll need it waxed to tie it off. Keep down the fuzzies. All right, so let's wrap this again. And let's see, things got a little wrapped up here. Uh, 
All right. Just going to wrap the head up a little bit just to clean up all the, the little fuzzy bits. Okay, I'm going to relax my thread. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm using the, the light color of the screen to see how many, how many fuzzies I've got left to, to, to mash down. <laughs> um, but yeah, that looks pretty good. Going to whip finish. Trim. Yeah, and there we go. Um, pretty good looking full feather wing, freestyle salmon fly, tied with materials that you can get from, you know, commonly from, you know, your local fly tying shop, or uh, alternatively, you can get most of these feathers from, you know, friends who are hunters, or uh, your local pet shop. Uh, probably the only thing that you will need to order special is the Kingfisher. And I highly recommend that if you're going to be tying a lot of classic salmon flies, you invest in a couple of good Kingfisher skins. Um, yeah. Uh, the other thing that I think I mentioned last week that I uh, encourage you to invest in are some good silks. Uh, Cause uh, you know, good silk will, uh, Good silk will uh, increase the, the quality of your body, your bo silk, uh, silk floss bodies. Um, other than that, you know, this was tied on a on a on an antique eyed hook, uh, but it could be tied on any salmon fly hook of appropriate size. This is a four out hook, so this is pretty big. Um, I highly recommend that if you're going to be tying salmon flies, you should probably, or you know, you want to start. Um, Start around, you know, one aught to three aught, and that's simply because it's easier to find materials that'll tie a one aught or a three aught hook. Uh, it's very, if you're getting up into like the five aught, six aught size, um, those materials can get pretty expensive. So if you're doing salmon flies on a budget, tie the smaller sizes. Sure. Uh, you know, you'll have to use, you know, they may not look so good in a frame, but they're good practice. And again, if you can tie the smaller sizes, you can tie the bigger sizes. It's just, you have to do a little bit more. Um, so anyway, uh, this is our freestyle. Um, I'll get pictures. Of, I'll, I'll, I'll put some head cement on. And uh, after the head cement dries, I'll get pictures up on Instagram uh, thanks for hanging out. Uh, if you want to see more of my work, my Instagram is at justwondering.brad, B-R-A-D. Uh, if you want to support the stream, help me buy a new fly tying vice. Uh, it's uh, Studio 1213 on Etsy. Uh, you can see uh, I have a whole bunch of flies, uh, some of them that are tied on stream uh, for sale. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, next week, oh, Next week, big announcement. Um, next week, I will be at the, uh, I think it's Thai Fest. Yeah, next week is Thai Fest, uh, 22nd, 23rd of February. And that's at the uh, uh, Marriott, the BWI Marriott in Maryland. Uh, that's by the BWI Airport, uh, Baltimore, Washington. Or Washington, Baltimore. It's by the... It's by the airport near Baltimore uh, at the Marriott there. And uh, I'll be, I have, I'll have a table. I'll be tying. And um, then March 14th, I'll be at the Maryland Fly Fishing and Collectible Tackle Show. And uh, yeah, hope to see you there. If you want to see me live, hang out, chat. And uh, thanks for watching. And next week, there won't be a stream because of the show. Uh, I think that was the important announcement. Uh, 
I think if I am going to stream that week, I will stream Friday. Uh, but I'm not 100% certain. I may not be able to stream at all. So keep an eye out. I'll announce it on my Instagram. Uh, and uh, yeah. So if you're in the if you're in the uh, Baltimore area, hopefully see you at the show. If not, thanks for hanging out, and I'll uh, catch you on the next stream. <laughs>